Hello everyone, it's Evelyn O'Loughlin from Volunteering SA and NT and I'm here with Dr Greg Ogle from SACOS. Thank you for joining us today for the webinar on the not-for-profit sector funding and contracting where we're going to give you an update of where things are at. I'm going to chat uh, initially to you uh, and go through a little bit of the context and the background of how we have um, where we where we started and uh, where we've landed, um, and then I'm going to hand over to Greg, and he'll talk you through uh, in more detail some of the the changes that have occurred to the contracts that you're used to seeing and what they look like now and what the clauses uh, the new clauses are. The first slide that um, I'm putting up on the screen just goes through a bit of the potted history of where this all began and you can see there that on uh, February 26, 2013, um, the Premier at the time, Premier, Premier Weatherall, uh, said um, at the Human Services Partnership Forum, it was it used to be called the Human Services Peaks Forum, you might be familiar with that, he said wouldn't it be great uh, if we could uh, look at ways of reducing red tape and administrative burdens for the not-for-profit sector when they are um, when government is contracting and funding the sector. And could this include streamlining uh, multi-departmental contracts into a more consolidated approach such as a single government contract? So even though a previous work had occurred before 2013, from that time on um, uh, there was a dedicated working group looking at how we could make this happen. On the 1st of July 2017, uh, cabinet uh, at the time and also the current government have uh, agreed to take forward the funding policy for the not-for-profit sector which is called PC44 uh, and it, uh, it actually applies across all of government for every government department and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. On the 1st of July 2017 um, what also happened was that government, uh, or sorry, cabinet approved mandatory indexation with set levels for all multi-year contracts. Now, for some of you, may, you may be aware of that, and others that might be new information. So it's really important to understand that um, a year and a half ago, government uh, was meant to be applying um, mandated indexation levels for all the funding to the not-for-profit sector at set levels. Uh, initially 2% and then going up to 2.5% and those levels will be set going forward. So that will help you to plan um, and, and know what money is coming in and what the indexation rate will be. And it also um, means that that hit and miss of government agencies deciding themselves whether they're going to apply any indexation because we know some departments uh, set the indexation rate at zero and others passed on the full indexation rate to the people they funded it takes away that hit and miss and makes it mandatory uh, across all government agencies that fund the not-for-profit sector. And today um, we're looking at what occurred from the 1st of January 2019, which is the simplified standard funding agreements, the ones that Premier Weatherall had asked us to look at back in 2013. They came into effect um, and that's really what we want to uh, talk through with you in detail today. Um, one of the things about everything that we're discussing is that this is all public information. It's not just Greg and I sharing information with you that, that we're privy to. Everything that we're discussing is available uh, either on the Department of Treasury and Finance website and I've included the slide there for you to see. Um, and it's also on the SACOS website and it's also on the Procurement Board website and I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. But if you go into the Department of Treasury and Finance's website, on the home screen you'll see uh, a tab that says Our Services. As soon as you click into Our Services, you'll see down at the bottom left hand corner the section that relates to all of the work and, and give some of the context and background that I'm describing to you today. Uh, in that uh, box there when you click on it. And earlier in the timeline uh, slide we talked about the Department of Premier, Premier and Cabinet Circular DPC Circular 44 which outlines the framework or the policy of how government should be working with the not-for-profit sector 
how um, uh, you know the principles that need to be applied when developing funding programs. It also man talks about the mandated use of the standardised indexation, um, and also um, you know other really important points. So. If you do nothing else from this webinar, do have a look at this uh, policy. It's really important because it does set the framework of how government and the not-for-profit sector uh, should be working uh, and in fact should be working from uh, the 1st of July 2017. That uh, policy has um, eight best practice principles and they're really important for you to, to understand. And also I would encourage you uh, when you do look at them because the, the actual policy document it just doesn't have the words on the page like I have them on the slide. It actually goes through in quite detail um, how the, what those principles mean and how they should work. And initially when we were um, looking at what principles there could be for government and the not-for-profit sector to apply, to uh, this red tape reduction funding, how we're all going to work together. Robust planning and design wasn't one of the principles, but we thought that that was, uh, you know, from the sector's point of view, really important that government co-designs how various buckets of money will be administered because the sector is, um, it has a lot of knowledge and experience around needs, um, about policy drivers, uh, about things that are really important in um, providing services to South Australians. So I encourage you to, to have a look at that uh, on the um, Department of Treasury and Finance's website. I'm just going to go down to the next slide, which is the uh, one of the screens of the State Procurement Board's website. The reason why um, I've taken a snapshot of this particular um, website is so that you know that from the procurement side there's a lot of information uh, there about procurement that occurs um, by not-for-profit uh, or you know with not-for-profit organisations for government and uh, you'll see that I have circled one particular document and this is a, a really another important one for you to click through to because it give, again gives guidance, uh, particularly to government workers, as to how they should be um, um, progressing with procurement that um, is um, undertaken by the not-for-profit sector. And in that document, it used to be there beforehand um, and now um, has been changed and updated to include some greyed out sections which um, are more relevant to the not-for-profit sector. So again, I. I would just ask that you have a look at that and that will give you a lot more information uh, about how this all works. Uh, and one of the things that has occurred over uh, the last sort of short period of time is looking at how, you know, the really important point about how government workers decide whether something is a procurement or it is uh, a grant. And we've had a definition of procurement for quite some time in the State Procurement Act and I won't dwell too much on that. I just wanted to reference it so that you knew that that was there. But what we haven't had um, for very long is a definition of a grant. So I've just flicked up to the slide that talks about that. That is now referenced in Treasurer's Instruction number 15. And it's really important for us to understand with the history of all of this that we haven't up until the 1st of January this year had a definition of a grant that government workers and the sector could look at and understand what the difference was between procurement and grant. People might have had their own understanding but um, it wasn't defined anywhere. So this is really quite important and historic that we now have a definition of a grant. Now that doesn't mean that because we've got a definition of a grant and we had a definition of procurement that everything is going to be really black and white as to where it sits as, as to whether it's a grant or a procurement. But it does make life a lot simpler um, because um, there's no um, there's no vacuum, there's no, you know, not having a definition uh, created, uh, you know, places where people could make decisions um, and not have 
that um, one source of information, i.e. the definition. But nonetheless, the most important part from my, from my perspective of why I'm putting up those two definitions of procurement and grant is these words on this slide, which are directions to uh, government em employees which say when determining if the funding is a grant or a procurement operation, a key consideration is determining if the expenditure is for the public authority, i.e. the government's own undertaking, or for the undertaking of the recipient, i.e. the not-for-profit sector organisation. Now, you know, I think that that, that really gives some clear guidance, but there are times when um, one may ask or might, might question whether when government gives uh, funding uh, and has it as a procurement, whether it's for the organisation's own undertaking. Uh, and there are some examples that have come up. Um, and uh, I might just quickly just hand over to Greg to, to talk through a couple of examples um, about how one would determine if something is a grant or a procurement. Hi. So I always think about this as a sort of continuum in a sense. At one end, it's something that's clearly a grant. So, and the logic of a grant is we like what you do, here's some money and do more of it. And it could be, you know, um, a sports club purchasing kit or, or balls or bats or whatever for, for their, their teams. That's clearly a grant um, because the club itself is, the, is doing the undertaking and it's for their benefit. At the other end is procurement. The, the simple, simplest version, we're buying stationery for the office. It's clearly something for the government department's own use. Um, that's clearly procurement. But that also extends to human services, for instance, where if you think about, um, say, provision of, of services to kids in um, foster care or under the guardianship of the, of the minister, you know, because they're under the guardianship of the minister, they're clearly the government's responsibility, they're, and so any services are actually bought on, on behalf of the government. So in that sense, it's for the public authority's own undertaking, and that's a procurement. And somewhere in the middle is, you know, um, is a grey area where you could characterise something, you know, like extra financial counselling places for a financial counselling organisation. It could be for the organisation's own benefit to do more of what they're doing, or it could be the procurement of services. Um, and it, it, look, there's not a clear line there. Some of the thinking is just if it's something the government is responsible for doing and they've just decided to outsource it, it's probably procurement. If it's something that they're just supporting you to do, it's probably a grant. And you know, um, and then certain, and as we'll see in a minute, different things flow from that decision. But um, yeah, there's no. What we've got is the two clear endpoints, and that's that's new. Thanks, Greg. So that's really um, just a, a very quick potted history uh, of how we got to where we are today. So um, I will uh, hand over to Greg now um, and we'll go through um, his presentation and looking at those uh, grant and service contracts and helping you to get a better understanding of the changes that have occurred um, and the wins that we got and the ones that uh, we didn't, uh, you know, get as much progress on as we would have liked. So, bye from me. For now. Okay, thanks Evelyn. We will return to Evelyn because at the end of this we want to talk a bit about next steps and how we make sure this stuff gets better down properly. But um, for now, we, as Evelyn said, we just want to walk through the, the new contracts that are, are, are now online. Um, and the first thing and the reason why we've just been talking about grants versus procurement is because even though what we've said is we've now got a standardised whole of government contract, there's in fact five contracts depending on um, what it is. And again, it's that first question, is it a grant or is it a procurement? If it's a grant, then there's two options. Is it under $10,000? It's, it's then simple, it's just a letter um, with an acquittal form attached to it and it says here's the money for this and give us the information about how you've spent the money. If it's over $10,000, and bear in mind all these figures are for the total um, extent of the grant, they're not per annum. So if you had a multi-year grant of sort of, of a three-year grant, 5,000 a year, that would be 15,000. You'd actually be in the upper category there. But yeah, a grant over 10,000 is a standard agreement 
and that's um, a, a much more complex legal document and that's one of the things we'll be walking through today. Similarly with procurement, under 23,000, it can just be an invoice, doesn't have to be a big contract, doesn't have to be a big deal. If it's over 23,000, again, for the whole course of the, the contract, um, then there is a standard contract, which is this legal document that we'll be going through today. And the, the fifth option is the standard goods and services contract, which the government uses for all its, um, its commercial procurement, um, uh, not relating to not-for-profits. Um, the only reason we don't use that as a standard for our sector is because it doesn't allow for payment up front. If you're actually just doing a service and then you want to bill the government and, and ask for, for that payment, that can be done under a standard goods and services contract. But if you want block funding to be paid up front to enable you to do extra services or, or to provide a service, because you've got that block funding up front, it needs to be under that um, procurement contract or the grant. Um, so it needs to be one of these specific not-for-profit um, contracts. And, that, and that's because there's a whole bunch of extra um, safeguards, if you like, for the government so that they can ensure that the money that they're giving you in advance will be spent on it. Now, the actual contracts themselves, the templates, are all up on that Treasury website. It's the one Evelyn pointed to you to before, but the address is again on the screen. Um, and you'll find all those contracts there. Um, yeah, and the Standard Goods and Services contract is on the State Procurement Board website that uh, Evelyn pointed you to. Um, still by way of background, but this is actually a slide from a presentation we did in December 2017 when we did the first round of, of just letting people know where we were up to. We were halfway through the negotiations. And what we said then is this is what we're trying to achieve. Now, the fact that we've got uniform contracts, so there's not a different contract for every program and every department, that's, that was the key achievement. Hopefully that will produce some red tape reduction for our sector. Um, but also some of the clauses we've managed to negotiate we think will also reduce red tape directly. Um, we, we were after clarity of clauses because I, I know from our, our own contracts there are clauses in a contract with SACOS that I don't know what they mean. We asked the department and they don't know what they mean and it's like what is that doing in the contract? Um, so we've tried to make sure that all the clauses, even though they're written sometimes in legalese, at least they actually have a clear meaning. Um, Similarly, we, we tried to remove a lot of one-sided clauses which just said, you will do X, Y, and Z as we describe and you get no say in it. You know, PC44, as Evelyn pointed out, is a partnership model and we've tried to reflect that in the clauses of the contract and we've tried to remove just some extraneous and bizarre stuff that snuck into some of the old contracts as they were added in bits and pieces for whatever the issue of the day was. Okay, so just again before we go on to look at the contracts, just a few um, caveats. This was a, a long negotiation and, and a negotiated outcome is give and take. We didn't get everything we wanted, um, but I hope we made significant progress. Uh, but what we're dealing with here are templates and particularly what we were negotiating was the, the basic terms and conditions, the legal terms and conditions that surround it. That doesn't deal with the actual descriptions of your, your services you're providing or the, the costs and the prices that the government's willing to pay, all that stuff has to be negotiated contract by contract in, in any particular tender. That can't be done at a whole of government statewide level. But what we've got and what we're dealing with here is a standard set of terms and conditions um, that apply to all contracts. Um, and the other thing to note is that we can't fix everything with the contracts. Certainly, you know, that's at the end of a procurement process, if you like, and we're all familiar with the, you know, um, the 100-page tender document where we've got two weeks to put in the, the tender or the application for funding, you know, that doesn't get fixed by the contract because that comes after that. However, in one of the documents Evelyn pointed to, the framework that's on the State Procurement Board website, if it's a procurement as opposed to a grant, then there are some, in those grey boxes that Evelyn referred to, there are some guidelines about um, how they should um, timetable, if you like, the um, the procurement process to give NGOs um, time uh, um, to have a meaningful input into the process. So again, we'd encourage you to look at that. The last thing about the contracts, in a sense, is while they are legal documents, they can't enforce themselves. We're actually relying on our sector to actually treat these as a legal document that belongs equally to both parties. It's not 
a contract is not simply a directive from one party to another. It's an agreement between two parties. Um, and so it's going to require people to actually understand what their rights are and what their responsibilities are with the contract and to use that in, you know, in a sense it's a negotiating tool, um, the rights that, that are enshrined in these contracts. Having said that, we're very clear that, you know, it is difficult. Um, the word at the bottom of the screen there, the monopsony power, often the government is the only funding source for the work that you desperately want to do or the um, activities that you want to do. Uh, and so that creates a, an imbalance of power. Um, and look, we're, we're really mindful of that and that does sometimes create difficulties in negotiating fair outcomes. One of the reasons we pushed so hard and were really keen on this process was because there wasn't any money on the table when we were negotiating. So instead of being out, instead of negotiating particulars of an agreement where there was, you know, one side was desperate for money, we were actually able to have much more print con conversations based on principle and what's best practice should look like. Um, and we were in a much stronger position than often the sector is. So we went pretty hard because we knew this was a great opportunity for the sector. Um, and look, having put all those caveats in that we haven't solved all the problems of the world here, the contracts, as I say, they are legally binding documents. They do provide a framework by, for the funding and they provide some limitations. Um, and to expand on that, we need to be clear what the legal importance of the contracts are because one of the things here where we've got uniform contracts is that the departments are bound by the templates. So what, what you see when you go to those websites and download the templates, this is the only contract that is available. If it fits that category, you know, if it's a grant over 10,000 or if it's a procurement over 23, every department is bound to use those. They literally do not have authority anymore as of 1st of January, unless Treasury approves them to do something different, they don't have authority to issue a different contract. Now there will be um, transitional arrangements. If you're halfway through a negotiation, um, Treasury will likely just approve, you know, continuing on with, with that. But for new funding arrangements, um, what we will see is these new contracts will be will be used for all new funding arrangements, and in time, and they will be the only option. So that means departments can't add clauses; they can't make up their own contracts, and um, so that you will know that every contract looks the same. And if they do try and change the contracts, particularly the, the sort of standard terms and conditions or change the form of the contract or the requirements, they actually have no authority to do that. They're actually acting illegally. They're acting beyond their power. And that's actually maladministration if, if they're acting beyond their power. And you're legally bound under the ICAC legislation in South Australia to report that to the Office of Public Integrity. If the way the ICAC Act works is that if you are a recipient of government funding through a contract or a grant, um, if you are contracted to do work for the government, you're a public officer under that act with certain obligations and one of those obligations is to report instances of corruption or maladministration and you don't have a choice about that. You will be in breach of the act if you don't. And that should create an interesting dynamic because it means that you know, the government has their own legislative background for what they can and can't do in a procurement process, but so do we, and we're bound by that, and they shouldn't put... So, you know, you can imagine the conversation when they go, oh, look, we want to include this um, this extra bit here, and you go, or oh, we want to use this... We don't want to use the template contract. We want to... We've got our own contract. You go, no, you, you can't do that. You don't have the authority. Or have... First question, have you got authority from the Treasury to do that? Um, and if the answer is no, well, they can't tell you, you, go, well, look, that puts me in a really hard position because, you know, if you don't have the authority, I can't be seen to be signing that or agreeing to it and I'm actually bound to report that to the Office of Public Integrity and I don't want to do that, so can we just actually get use, use the standard template? Now, look, that's pretty hard push and shove and it, it inevitably, you know, it won't get to that, but that is the, the legal importance of the contracts and that is the, the legal background that we're talking about. So, you know, these contracts are legal documents and they should be treated seriously. So, to the structure of the documents. Um, so, the grants and service agreements, slightly different. The grant has a cover letter, the service agreement just has a block of this is an agreement between the Minister of Department and X not-for-profit. But both of, the, both of them basically then just refer to a whole series of attachments that go with that. And attachment one is what we're calling the moving parts. 
And that's the sort of summary of all the things that are particular to that contract that, that can change. And that's a big improvement from the current structure we've got, whereas if I look at our, our SACOS contract, for instance, I've got to go to about page eight before I can find out how much it's for and over what period, and there's some other vital bit of information I need on page 10 and something else is somewhere else. In the new templates, everything that's going to change in terms of just the, not the description of services or, or the description of what you're doing, but just the, the standard, you know, uh, start date, finish date, um, reporting requirements, all that and, and amount of funding, all that is just in this moving part document. And when you look at it, you can see just a whole bunch of boxes there. And that should be clear um, and easy to find that information. Attachment two then is the standard terms and conditions which we've been negotiating. And they, they will be the same and cannot be altered in any contract. So every contract you get will have those same standard terms and conditions. And that means once you've got your head around it once, you don't need to worry about it. You will just know what's in there, which is again quite different to where we are now, where you've got to go through pages of legalese for every different contract because it might be different. So this, again, standardization is good and we'll go through later some of the actual terms and conditions and, and talk about what they mean. Attachment three is special conditions if particular circumstances apply. Now this doesn't mean that departments can just um, write in extra conditions to apply to the contract. It just means that there are some things which don't apply to all contracts, but if the circumstances apply, then they can use a clause bank. So for instance, if you've got a grant and there is a, a construction, so you know if you're buying footballs, it doesn't apply. If you've got a grant to you know, build a new clubhouse, um, then there are clauses that deal with construction and they go in. Similarly, if the, in human services, if the information sharing guidelines apply that we've, we've been used to dealing with, then there is a clause about information sharing that goes in. It doesn't mean a department can make up their own clause about information sharing or child screening or any of the, the special clauses. So it's really a, it's a series of yes or no questions and if the answer is yes, they draw down from the clause bank and put it in and it will appear at attachment three in your contract. From there it goes a bit different. The grants then just have a, the acquittal form at the back and that's just, that'll be the template. This is how you report the financials on, on this document. And once it's there, then you know what you're going to be reporting on. That's at attachment six in the service agreement and four in the grants. Um, the service agreement attachment four is basically the description of the services and that that's, will be where all the nitty gritty um, uh, negotiation takes place. You know, what the service is, how many people, what location, what target groups, all that will be in the description of, of services. Um, and then the attachment five block funding and payment details will simply be the you know, okay, here's the payment schedule um, and here's where it gets paid. Um, and then again, the acquittal form at the end. Now, so we've been through context and the structure of the documents. What we're going to do um, now is look at the, um, a lot of the key issues and the detail, clause by clause detail, just the key issues. Um, this will get terribly boring. So for, because of that, we've introduced a few, um, an, a nice trip around South Australian landscape. And so what you're looking at there is the Gammon Ranges um, north of the Flinders. I think that's Mount McKinley in the background. Um, but while we're looking at that and contemplating um, great arid wilderness area, uh, I'd just say, yeah, we're going on, we will go on to the key issues. I would say all this stuff is actually explained in more detail and there are some things which we won't go through today but are particular things. In the document that's called the briefing note, it's on the SACOS website that um, in the funding guidelines section or it's also there under a fact sheet and it goes through this clause by clause. So everything I'm about to say is in this document and more. Um, so I'm just doing in a sense the selected highlights of that document but I would really encourage people to download that document have it with you when you first get to see these new contracts when they first start appearing on your desk as the funding instrument. It will give you an explanation. It, it, firstly, it compares the grants and the procurement so you can see whether the, they're the same or different or any differences. And then there's some commentary in the third column um, which is my either explanation of what the clause means or why it's important or um, 
the possibilities for use for you or the traps that might um, arise from it. So it's a sort of commentary and hopefully it will be a good cheat sheet for you when you actually deal with, come to the negotiations. Okay, from the Gammon Rangers, we go to key issues. And in going through the key issues, I'm starting at a really obscure place, which is the Service Agreement Clause 31 or the Grant Agreement Clause 22, um, headed entire agreement. And this is a fairly standard legalistic clause in a contract, but it's actually particularly important in this contract. And basically, the clause just says, you know, this is the entire agreement. Um, there's, you know, there's no other documents that make up the agreement for this particular um, set of activities. That's really important for two, a couple, two reasons. One is because it means if you've been told something through the um, through the contract negotiation, oh yeah, we're, we're going to do that, or we we're, we want you to do that, or we won't we won't want you to do that, whatever. None of that matters in a legal sense. Legally, all you're required to do is what's written in the contract, and if it's not written in the contract, then legally it doesn't exist. Um, so, if you're relying on that, and and you know you've been assured by the person you're dealing with that, um, you know, oh, they won't re require this or they won't require that. Okay, you can take that risk, but just bear in mind that's not legally binding and you can't come back to them later and say, oh, but you said we wouldn't have to do that. That has no legal legs. The other thing that this entire agreement clause means is that the master agreements that apply in human services and I think health um, in some areas do not apply. So this, this contract has not come under your master agreement um, and what that means is eventually as these new contracts take over and all new, you know, increasingly your existing contracts will run out, they will be replaced by new contracts in this format and eventually you will have no contracts anymore under the master agreement in which time, by which time it thankfully becomes redundant. You can either just then ignore it or you can formally um, terminate it by writing to the minister or the, whatever the termination clause says in it. Um, but yeah, when this clause says this is the entire agreement, it specifically means that there are no other government policies that apply other than the ones that are specifically labelled in the contract and no, and the master agreement doesn't apply. That's what this clause means in practice. Uh, another really important clause here is the variation of contract. Um, clause 5 in the service agreement and 24 in the um, grant agreement. Um, again, in some ways standard that either party can apply to vary the contract and that you know, means just something's come up, you want to do something differently. The key thing, however, in this contract is that neither side can just say, oh, we're going to do this differently or government can't say, we, do, we want you to do this differently. There is a process set out in clause 5 which is either side notifies the other of what they want to do, but if the government says to you, oh, we now want you to do this, you know, we want to change the reporting arrangement, we want you to do more complex work, we want you to do, see more people, whatever, um, then the, con the clause clearly says, then you put in a quote and say how much that's going to cost, um, if, if there is a cost, um, and then you enter into good faith negotiation. Now, if the variation is fine and you're happy with it, easy, fine, you just, in right, you, it, the variation must be agreed in writing, so neither agreed in writing, so it's not just one side sending out a, a missive from um, that says we have varied the contract to say this. It's actually got to be agreed and signed by both sides, and um, yeah, and you actually get to ask for money if there are more impositions on you. And as we'll see, that's actually crucial if you think about the format and the structure we were talking about before. Even something as basic as the financial acquittal. So appendix uh, attachment four for grants and attachment six for service agreements was the template for here's, here's how you, you cover the finances and here's how you acquit the, the money. What this means is they can't just change that and they can't decide that if the agreement says we, you do that every six months or every 12 months, then they can't part way through go, oh no, now we want you to do it every three months or no, we want you to use this form and can you record this data as on top of, of what you're doing. Now there might be good reasons for that, but if, but if they want to change the format and the reporting, then that's actually a variation of the contract and you get to negotiate how much that will cost. So if you want to go to three month, um, you go three month reporting, you know, it was listed as 12, or if you want all this extra data, it's going to cost us another $2,000 to do that so we want 2,000 more and then you, they can decide they don't want the data, 
or they don't want the change, or they will pay it, or you have a negotiation about whether that's the right sum of money. But that's actually really important and a really empowering tool as we go forward. Okay. Um, goal arranges. So we end up on this journey around the state, we end up doing a, a bit of a loop. So we've gone from the Flinders in the, the sort of far north, uh, Gammon Ranges in the far north, now to the Gawler Ranges in the middle of the Eyre Peninsula and some pretty impressive rock formations there. Um, okay. In the service agreement, the, the clauses, there's quite long clauses, four and six, and they generally just refer to attachment four in description of service. Really, most of these clauses are just the legal enablers that say that you've got to do the working clause for, so you know, you've got to do the work, you've got to do it to particular standards, you've got to do it on time, you've got to have the authority to do it. Pretty basic stuff. Um, and as I say, it's really just the legal mechanism to enable clause four to have legs. But the crucial clause here is clause 4.4D, or 20 in the grant agreement. And it says you've got to abide by government policies notified in writing at the time of commencement of the contract. That's actually really crucial. Look, we argue that not-for-profits are autonomous organisations and we shouldn't be bound by government policies. We should be funded to produce outcomes and that should be the end of the story. We weren't successful in that because the government was nervous about you know, how things are done. Um, but what's crucial is that notified in writing at the time of commencement. Our current um, agreements say we've got to abide by any policies notified from time to time which means that we get halfway through a contract and the government may put in a new policy and they could do it for very good reasons. They could decide, you know, um, there's been some problems and now they want everybody providing this service to have a certificate level four or some other qualification. Um, and that could result in considerable new expenditure. And that means at the beginning of a contract you agree you're going to provide a service for X amount of money and if it can be changed halfway through and you can't control that, you can't actually contract and do your planning properly. So what we've got now is that all that's got to be done up front so at least you will know what policies you, you have to abide by and can factor that into the costs. Um, and if they then halfway through want to add new policies and new requirements, that's a variation of contract and you know, so again, if they come up with a policy that says this has got to happen, then you go, okay, that will cost you X amount of money. You go back to that variation of clauses, that variation of contract clause. It'll cost you X amount of money and then you negotiate that. Um, they can't just unilaterally vary the contract, which is the current situation. Okay. Now, from the middle of the Air Peninsula, we're moving further west. Um, on the left-hand side is Mount Fink at the north end, uh, or in the Yellowbinna Wilderness area, north of Sejuna. Uh, and on the right of screen is, I think, the Gravillia Turiana, which is a, a plant found nowhere else in the world apart from on the slopes of Mount Fink, uh, a pretty remote and special part of the world. Okay. Um, Indexation, Evelyn talked a bit about before in terms of the policy that was passed 18 months ago. The indexation clauses in the contract are largely just the, uh, the embedding of that policy into these contracts. Um, as Evelyn said, indexation must be applied and it, uh, and it set, the rate is set externally, departments don't have the, a choice. And again, departments have resisted that and, um, and said, oh no, it doesn't apply to us or whatever. But at the point when these contracts are the only contracts that are available, these clauses are embedded there and so it must happen. The other thing about the clauses you can see, um, the indexation applies on each anniversary um, of the contract. So if you've got a one year contract and then you get a six month extension, that last six months should be paid with the indexation on top of the, the existing um, base rate. Um, the invoicing is messy. There's longish clauses there in clause eight of the sector agreement for the grant agreement. Um, but it, one of the key issues here is whether it's a recipient created tax invoice, so whether the government issues its own invoice or whether you as the not-for-profit issue invoices to the government. Um, that's an, a tick box in attachment one, so you, you can see in attachment one there's a, a chance of either you tick which one you're doing so that it's clear upfront in the contract who, who is responsible for issuing the invoices. Look, 
my gut feeling is that I wouldn't recommend doing an RCTI if you have a choice because it, it just hands over the control of the process to government and it can often delay some late payment entitlements because of the way the Act works. Um, and you're relying on the, you're just building another step while you've got to provide a service, wait for the government to issue an invoice, and then they have 30 days to pay their own invoice. I would suggest if it, if it's not an imposition on you administratively, if it's easy enough to do administratively, I would suggest you try and do that. Um, tick the box that says you'll issue the invoice. I'm not sure what the department's attitude to that will be. Um, but just do be aware that, again, because this is the entire agreement, it supersedes any previous agreements around this stuff, including the master agreement. So, you know, and in effect, so if they say, well, we've always done it this way, or you agreed to do this last time, and such, it's, it's not relevant. You have to make the agreement every time you sign one of these contracts. Okay. Now, that is a spider web. I won't ask you where it is or or even tell you where it is, but you can see the, some of the red soil in the background. So we're still out in the desert country um, on a dewy morning. And various people have pointed out that this is actually a useful metaphor for the legal contracts we're dealing with. OK. The next issue we want to highlight is the issue of unexpended funds. This was one of the, um, in a sense, hardest fought negotiations um, in the contract, it was certainly one we, we pushed hard on. Um, and unfortunately, we didn't get everything we wanted. Um, our argument was the government agrees to pay a price for the, the contract, and um, if, the, if it's delivered, what's the problem? Why are you asking for your money back? Um, but here we are. The, the terms are, are as they are in the contract. And for a service agreement, you've actually got to report each year unless um, on your unexpended funds and at the termination of the contract and potentially you have to hand back any funds that you haven't used. The difference though and one of the good things about what we did negotiate at least you have a contractual right to put in a, to ask to keep the money to apply it for future funding and that can be, you know, there could be really good reasons like, you know, you may have a, a big expenditure due on July the 2nd and it should be, you know, it should be a no-brainer that you keep the money and, and then apply it then. But at least here you've got a right to um, to put that in, um, and I'll get to, and, and I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, I'd also just point out, attachment one actually gives you the option to um, change the reporting period, so you can have a try and see if you can get it extended to the end of the contract. Because the grant agreement, you only have to pay, um, have to do that unexpended funds report at the end of the grant agreement, um, and potentially pay it back then. So. That means you're not going through the sort of artificial um, accounting to zero every year. Um, but the key thing here is in both cases, if you you have a right under the contract to put in an application to, um, to keep the funds or to use them for some other good purpose, and in both cases the government the contract says the government must consider that request. And I read that as saying they can't just have a blanket policy and go. No, we we take we have a policy that we take back all unexpended funds because if that's their policy, they're not actually considering your request. So I would read that as they should actually consider your request individually on its merits. Um, so we wish you luck with that negotiation. We'll, we will be keen to hear how how that plays out. Okay, we're still in the far west of the state here. We're at uh, still just north and a bit uh, west of Sejuna. And this is the clay pans in the Umbra Conservation Park, bright red um, clay and um, significant area for the Flipping Island people out there. Um, okay, under some more key issues in the contracts, and these are a couple of wins. Um, insurance is set out, public liability, uh, actually, I think that's service agreement clause 18, not 17, but it clearly sets out you're required to have public liability insurance. And in attachment one, there's a tick box about whether or not you need professional indemnity insurance. That's probably only going to apply if you've got, you know, medical services or staff or or some other professionals where there could be, you know, legal action around that. Uh, mostly, that's probably not going to worry you. But the big thing is, they're the only two insurances that can be required under these contracts. Our current contract at Sancos has requirements for officers and directors insurance and uh, a number of other insurances and frankly 
that's our business, how we manage the risk in the organisation, whether we choose to take that insurance out or not. So that's all gone from this. The only two insurances that can be required under this contract is public liability in all contracts and professional indemnity maybe. And anything else, it is felt that's not in the contract and they can't ask for it. Um, intellectual property, again, a win. Um, because the, in the service agreements, it's really clear that the not-for-profit entity will own the, the intellectual property. And that's, that's 180 degrees different from where we are now. I'm always bemused that all my SACOS policy writings where I might write media releases, you know, condemning government policy or saying they should do this and this, and apparently the minister owns all those words. Um, under the new contracts, we will own the not we will own the intellectual property. Uh, and that can apply to training materials and, and information, education materials, public and techniques and a whole range of things. Um, we license the government to use them, but actually owning the, us owning the intellectual property means that the government can't just take that intellectual property and then basically um, outsource it to somebody else to deliver a service based on your IP. So we think that's actually potentially a, a quite important turnaround. It's not... Uh, the grants are different in that there's a tick box in attachment one as to who owns the property. To tell you the truth, I'm not sure why that's different to the service agreement. Um, I suspect the default will pretty much always be the not-for-profit owns the intellectual property. I don't know why it's different. It was a complex negotiation and some things just slipped through potentially. Um, yeah, but I think overall the intellectual property stuff is a win for the sector. Okay. Hopefully, and then when we did the face-to-face -face, um, meetings, uh, most people recognise this as the Bundercliff line at the head of the Great Australian Bight, um, home or carving areas for um, whales and for sea lions in the fallout zones on the cliff base, and a subject of some controversial offshore oil exploration a bit further out. Um, yeah, but also one of the iconic pieces of coastline in Australia. Okay, after that minor distraction, we get back to key issues um, and the reporting requirements. And again, the reporting, what's actually required to report is set out in attachment one. Um, and beyond that, it's very clear in the service agreement that if the government then decides they want more reporting, for whatever reason, uh, they need to pay for that reporting because they've made an agreement and you've costed your contract based on you will report X, Y, and Z at these intervals. And if they want more than that, it's going to cost you more money and resources to produce those reports, and they should pay. That's quite different from the, the current service agreements. Um, it doesn't apply to grants. However, the grant contract has a different limitation in that they can only ask for more reporting where they reasonably suspect that the, the money isn't being used for the purpose. They can't just ask for more, re more reporting or different reports um, because it's a new policy. Um, so yeah, that's quite different from the current arrangements. Um, and again, we discussed before the financial acquittal forms are set out in attachments four and six. Um, now th that financial acquittal, the default is that it's, unless it's buried, but the default is three months after the end of the financial year um, for the sort of unaudited financial acquittals. And then you, you've got to provide your full accounts organisational accounts within six months of the end of the financial year for reasons that neither Evelyn and I could understand or agree with, but nonetheless um, we couldn't get that removed. So you've got those twin reporting requirements. And crucially, we'd also draw your attention to the what we call the end of financial year straddling problem, because under that timetable, you can imagine a situation where you have a four-month grant or, or, or contract running from May till August. In theory, under that um, arrangement in um, in September you would have to do your financial acquittal for May and June. Bizarrely you probably don't have to do a financial acquittal for July and August because the contract will be dead by the time you get to the end of the next financial year. But you will have to provide your audit accounts in December for the May-June year and then the next December, some 14 months after you've finished your contract, you would in theory have to provide your full accounts, audited accounts for that year. 
because you had the funding for um, July and August. But this is clearly a nonsense. The good thing is it can be varied, so just be aware there's, again, you can vary it in attachment one. So if you do have that contract that straddles the financial year, make sure you, you use and negotiate a different reporting rate. Obviously, if it's a four-month contract um, from May till August, pretty obviously financial acquittals due at the end of, you know, within three months of the end of August. Like last year. Um, so yeah, just be aware of that and make sure you, you know that that can be changed and it can be used to reduce your reporting requirement. Okay, we're coming a bit closer to home here. This is the Lincoln National Park at the bottom of the Eyre Peninsula. Um, still some very beautiful stretch of coastline there and yes the bush in the background is Lincoln National Park. Okay, that gives me a breather before we go on to what I've called the rights of invasion. Um, in the contracts you'll see it's, it's I think it's headed rights of inspection uh, or just inspection. Um, our current contract, bizarrely our master agreement, basically says that anyone in government can come into our properties at any time um, look at any document, ask any questions of any staff members about anything, even unrelated to the funding. This is clearly pretty nonsensical. Um, but at the other end of the, the scale, the government um, says, well, you know, we're giving you money in advance. We need to be able to see that it, it's being used for the right purposes and therefore we need some um, rights to be able to check up on that. So the sort of compromise we've got to in... In, this, in the clauses in these documents, and you can see the numbers there, 13 and 9, um, is that the government still has wide powers of inspection, but they're certainly more constrained than current contracts. They can only, you know, they've got to give advance notice in writing that they're, they're coming to do an inspection, um, and they can only ask questions and deal with issues relating to the funded services or the, the funded activities. And you'll see a lot in this clause and in uh, various other parts of the contract, the word reasonably is used, um, and that provides some limit on the action. There's no set definition, but if you're acting unreasonably, then in theory they don't have the power to do stuff under the contract. So, and it's quite different from just saying, you know, um, so the unexpended funds clause we were talking about before, or the reporting clause, you know. So I've actually got to reasonably believe that the, the money um, isn't being used for purpose before they can ask for more reporting under the grants contract. If, it, if the, that reasonable definition wasn't there or the um, caveat wasn't there, they could just ask for it anyway, whether their belief was reasonable or not. So um, you can challenge them on whether their, their um, belief is reasonable or not, their definitions are reasonable where that's used. Okay, we're now doing a, finishing what's effectively a loop of the state because now we're in the northeast corner of the state. That's the Kungi Lakes National Park flowing off the Cooper Creek in the north northeast corner of the state and some pretty amazing bird life, internationally recognised um, sanctuary for bird life there. Um, and yes, and the sunset should give you a hint that we're getting close to the end of the presentation. But unfortunately, and first up, we have our final key issue and it's the, the screening procedures and it's a mess. There's a flowchart of how I think it works, but it's a bit tentative. Um, that's loaded up on the SACOS website, and you can see it, although it's probably going to be fairly small in a minute, but I do think this is a mess. And the flowchart of how I think it works is tentative because the new um, Child Safety Act, doesn't a lot of that doesn't come online until the middle of this year, and there's still um, regs to be worked out and, when, and how that will work in practice. And also, look, this is such a mess that we've asked for a review and the working group that did the negotiation of this, we've, uh, Evelyn and I have asked to put it on the agenda so we may try and work this differently. But from my take at the moment, my, my best guess is you start with the legislation and ask is screening required by the legislation? And in South Australia there's three pieces of legislation that would require screening um, if, it, if it's around children if it's a disability service or aged care, there's a Commonwealth legislation that requires screening of aged care, although that's largely just criminal checks. It doesn't necessarily deal with, uh, it doesn't require the screening of through the DHS screening unit that um, the other state legislation does um, in terms of child disability. And the people that need to be screened are usually 
um, people with unsupervised contact, uh, people accessing records, because that's, you know, you can imagine it, it is actually fairly sensitive and important if you've got access to um, kids' names, medical records, um, social records or whatever. That's actually puts you in a position of power. So, you know, screening is required there even if you're not actually face-to-face -face contact with the kids. Um, and if you're in authority over the program or over people who are having contact in supervisory capacity, um, you need to be screened. Crucially, though, the actual screening for people in contact with kids or people with disability under the Act is if it's unsupervised access. Um, so, for instance, if you've got kids at a, a service and you need the plumber to come in for a day and the plumber hasn't been screened, under the legislation, that's okay as long as that plumber is supervised the whole time. So you just need to stick a staff person on, you know, in their vicinity and supervising them. Um, that's different, as we'll see, to the clause of the contract. Because what happens from there, so that's the, the legislation is the starting point, but there are clauses in the contract potentially that go above the requirements of legislation and impose extra requirements. But if you start from is screening required by legislation, if it's a grant and it's not required, that's easy, you can see it there in the green box on the right of the screen, you get on with the job. If it's yes, then you've got to do the screening as required by the Act um, and then notify the government that you've screened everybody and it's fine. Um, and under the new Child Safety Act, I think you've got to notify the policies that you've got in place for child safety time. Um, but either way, whether it's a yes or a no, under legislation in the procurement area, there are other parts, as I just said, where the, there are potentially other requirements in the Act. Um, one of the places you will find that is in Attachment 1 at item, I can't read that, I think it's 21, um, where there's simply a, 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 a box where the government can list other screening requirements and they could just require you to screen other particular roles, you know, they could require you to screen everybody, they could require extra types of screening. Um, that will be up to negotiation in the contract, but that's where you will find it. Um, and if that's there, then you follow the yes and you've got to do the screening. The bigger issue, though, is in the special clause bank because there's a, a question that the um, departments when they're administering these contracts, there's a question for them which is, will children be present in the delivery of this service? Again, we're only dealing with service procurement, we're not dealing with grants. Will children be present? If so, you may use these clauses, which means that departments may choose not to, they may choose that the, um, the legislation is enough, but they may choose to invoke these special clauses, clause five and six, and if it's the Department of Education or Child Protection, it is mandatory they must insert these clauses into your contract. I'm not saying this makes sense and I'm not defending it. I'm just saying this is my best guess about how it works. Um, the discussion around this wasn't a, was the low point of negotiation in a sense. There wasn't a lot of give and take or even explanation of taking on board stuff. The rest of the discussion was about negotiation with a very goodwill uh, approach from both sides. Um, however, so if children are present, and again, that's above the legislation requirements because this would require your plumber to be screened even if they're supervised because the, this clause just relates to if children are present. It doesn't matter whether the adults are supervised or not. So if children are present and you have these clauses, you, you might get these clauses in your contract. And if so, you've then got to do the screening, not just as required by legislation, but as required by these clauses. The clauses are quite long, they're detailed, badly drafted, and but they create particular requirements and particular procedures, um, including that you've actually got to report the, the relevant history of your personnel to government. Whereas in the other screening, you can just say, yes, we have screened and there's no problems. If under this clause you've actually got to report the relevant history to government, and that could be a staff list with their numbers, I don't, I'm not clear how that will work. Um, and there's also other post-screening action required in terms of staff training, um, having the policies in place. Some of that just reflects the Child Safety Act, so I'm not even sure why it was required as extra. Um, and procedures if someone becomes unsuitable sort of partway through the, the service agreement. But just so just keep an eye out of how complicated that is 
because there are different places where you can be required to do screening and you've got to ensure that you, you meet all of those requirements. If, however, you're doing a procurement and the answer is no, there's nothing in at attachment one and there's, there's nothing in the special course bank and you're not required by legislation, then you can get on with it without the screening. Um, the address at the bottom is the uh, DHS screening units website. It's got a lot of information about how the screening works. Um, it, it tends to suggest more screening is required than may be the case under legislation but it is actually a reasonable resource in terms of just explaining how it works. Um, and as we just had sunset, we can probably go back to sunset. Yes, and I'll call that the end of the presentation and I'll hand back to Evelyn just to talk a bit about, you know, uh, how we actually enforce this and make this stuff happen because what we've given you is a, a tool and hopefully explained some of the uses of the new contract. Um, so yeah, I'll hand back to Evelyn and she can talk about that and where we might go from here. Thanks. Thanks so much, Greg. That was uh, terrific. And look, it's um, really fantastic, all the work that's been achieved. And these are really historic times that we have got this consistency across government. Um, and part of the puzzle is um, culture change within government agencies to be sure that uh, um, people that work in procurement and in grant funding sections of any government department uh, are trained and understand that this does apply um, and how it works. But one of the really important things I'd like to get across is, you know, you are our voices, you the sector are there to, um, to really to champion the um, not-for-profit funding policy, the eight principles, the indexation, um, the clauses in the contract, the power imbalance that's there to, if you feel uncomfortable, to, you know, to, to recognise I think now you have more of a voice than we've probably ever had before in the sector in South Australia. So for my part I would ask that you become champions of um, all of this change that's occurred in redressing um, um, the power imbalance the, the red tape that we've had there and, and trying to get rid of it and to find more streamlined ways to work collaboratively with government uh, as much as possible in a partnership environment. Now that's not always going to happen and, there, and we've already had examples um, come up where um, government agencies haven't adhered to what we think is pretty straightforward and clear and that they should be. So, you know, how do we deal with that? Well, um, if there's an issue with procurement, you can go to the State Procurement Board. If there's an issue with grants, uh, if you go onto the Treasury and Finance website, you'll see there that there's a information there about who you can complain to. It's always a little bit difficult because you're dealing with the power imbalance of complaining about the funder when the funder gives you money. So, um, it's really important that you go back to your peak bodies um, you let them know. We've, I should have actually said right at the beginning, we've worked collaboratively with the Arts Industry Council of South Australia, Sport SA, and the Conservation Council uh, of South Australia, as well as SACOS and Volunteering SA and to try and capture all of the uh, parts of the sector um, as much as possible. Uh, although, you know, of course, it's a very big sector and there are, you know, many thousands of organisations. Go back to your peak bodies if you feel that something is not going um, how you thought it should be. Um, also, you can um, get in touch with um, Greg and myself if you think there are systemic issues we need to be aware of because something might be happening to you, but actually it's happening across to all of the organisations that are funded by a particular agency or department. Now, going forward, um, Volunteering SA and NT put up uh, at the last election an idea of a not-for-profit and volunteering advocate that did get some uh, support, from, well, got support from the major parties. What that might look like, um, what you know, whether that would actually work is something that um, will be looked at in the, the next few years. So that's not an immediate uh, answer to any issues you may be having uh, right now or maybe having when you're coming up to your first new contract uh, negotiation. So um, keep in mind all the avenues that are there and if you think that there's something that we need to know, please uh, don't hesitate to get in touch. Um, it's um, really important to acknowledge the really great work 
that many government officials have done in a spirit of collaboration and partnership to get us where we are. We also thank everybody that's been involved uh, from the not-for-profit sector side. Um, it's, it's really been a, a massive piece of work over a very long period of time. It's not ended in my mind. Um, and as Greg said right at the beginning, this is sort of like the middle bit. Um, how we apply for grants and funding and how we acquit grants and other funding to me are still important areas to take forward. It might be another six years before we can report back on uh, making any progress with that. Um, but, um, you know, we really are very pleased uh, about uh, what's been achieved so far, uh, even though it's been a long process. So we'll close off the webinar with this beautiful slide and thank you very much for participating um, and uh, please don't hesitate to share this information with your colleagues, with other people in the sector. It's really important that you become the voices for this, the champions for this great work so that um, we can hold uh, government uh, to account in, um, in the obligations that they've agreed to. Um, and, and also feel more empowered as part of it all. Thanks very much. Bye from me. Thank you.